Hello and welcome to New Light Baptist Church of Harlem, New York. Our senior pastor is the Reverend Bobby Lewis, and we are so glad you stopped by to join us today. We are about to go into service right now. So, come on in. Good morning. Can we pull that scripture up? They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's Isaiah 11, verse 9. Good morning. I'm Minister Mark Lanham. I'd like to welcome you to our virtual sanctuary this morning. And just know that whether we're worshiping online or whether we're worshiping in person, we believe that the Lord is in this place. And we're so happy that you came and joined us today. When I think about that verse from Isaiah, one of the things that I thought about is this painting by Edward Hicks called The Peaceable Kingdom. Um, some of you may be familiar with this. This is a painting that Edward Hicks painted back in 1844 that was inspired by that verse from Isaiah. And I learned a couple of interesting things about Hicks. First of all, that he was a Quaker. And some of you who know things about Quakers know that they are very dedicated to peace. They're pacifists. If there's a war, if there's a draft, they will often be conscientious objectors and refuse to, to go and fight. Um, the other thing that was interesting is he only painted subjects that related to his spiritual beliefs in his whole life. And I was astonished to find out that during his lifetime, he painted 62 versions of this painting, The Peaceable Kingdom. So you might say that he was really obsessed with the idea of peace. And I, you know, I share that feeling with him because I feel like these days I'm really obsessed with the idea of, of peace in this world that is so at war. And I also think it's good to reflect on this, this painting by Hicks because this is how God intended it to be. You know, he wanted us to live in that Garden of Eden forever, but it was our own disobedience that got us kicked out. And I want to show you an image that's the opposite of peace. This was taken in Mariupol um, after the Russian bombing. As you can see, it's just it's just rubble. There's nothing left. Um, so this war in, in the Ukraine has gone on now for more than five months. And I would encourage you because these people need our prayers now more than ever. And especially for the kids, can you bring up that next shot? The other um, photo that tore me up this week was I found these kids online who are selling their artwork to try to raise a little money and also spread a little light in that darkness. So we really, really need to pray for the, the kids that are in these war torn areas because they are the ones that will have to deal with the, the legacy of this, these wars that often affect kids up to the third and fourth generation. So let's come before the Lord and pray. Lord, we know that the world will be a more peaceful place if it weren't for our disobedience. Turn us around. Bring us back to you. Let your peace take root and bloom in our hearts so we will have no cause to make war. Bless all those who work for peace. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen, 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 hallelujah. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, good morning, church family. My name is Deacon Al, and I am here with your announcements for the week. Uh, starting with our minister on duty this week. Minister on duty will be Deacon Ray Lewis. He can be reached at rlewis at nlbcnyc.org, rlewis at nlbcnyc.org. For all of your um, needs and concerns or prayer requests, you can uh, contact him. Um, just join us for our Bible study this week at, seven, uh, at uh, 6.30 at, on Wednesday for a deeper dive and a deeper dig into the word that uh, Pastor Charmaine will be bringing today. Um, calling all women, all ladies, uh, please come out and uh, join us for uh, Dinner and Dresses, August 4th at 7 p.m. Um, you must RSVP by July 27th. That day is already gone. But if you still want to uh, try to reach out and see if you can attend, you can contact um, uh, Deacon Talisha at T Germain at NLBCNYC.org. That's also, um, let's talk about our bu building fund today. Uh, the building fund. I want to thank you all for continuing to support and continuing to give as you have been led by the Holy Spirit to do so. Uh, buildings and grounds team, the trustees, we are doing. Uh, work of the Lord to try to go out and try to see if we can find what he has already called and written for us to have. Amen. Um, if there is any, if you have any opinions, uh, concerns, or even just if you know someone that that is in this area that could help us out, please, please reach out and contact us. Now moving on to the NLBC NYC mobile app. It is now available and I encourage you all to download it. When you want to download it, go down to the App Store or the Google Play Store and search for New Light Baptist Church NYC. And after you do that, I, I encourage you all um, to stay connected and join our online messaging community. 
Uh, we are not in a building at this time. So therefore, this is the place where we congregate and we stay connected. Go to the app home screen on your phone. That you have to click on the two small boxes on the upper right hand corner. Click on the two small boxes on the upper right hand corner and you will be prompted to join a group. Uh, after you join a group, you'll be successfully connected. If you have any questions or concerns on how to do this, please, please reach out to me. Uh, Deacon Al at a a cano at nlbcnyc.org. As far as uh, city relief is concerned, um, we want to thank you for all of you who have been coming out, being so faithful and to support and to take part and participate in, in God's good work of helping and serving people. Um, if you, the next one I believe is um, normally it's the second week of the second Saturday Saturdays of the month. So if you want to join on something like this, I would encourage you to email Pastor Charmaine at cdacosta at nlbcnyc.org if you want to participate. Uh, tithes and offerings, we want to thank you all for um, uh, continuing to be faithful with this. If you want to uh, donate tithes and offerings, um, you, go, you can uh, do it by sn uh, snail mail, New Light Baptist Church, 2214. <clears throat> Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Suite 348, New York, New York, 10026. Or you can donate online, uh, nlbcnyc.org, or you can do it through the app. And just one more point I wanted to make, if you, when, when you're doing the building fund, make sure that you indicate that it's for the building fund in the memo section. Amen. Thank you all, and I love you. Hey, Brother Jeff, what's going on? Good morning, Deacon Al. How's it going? Good. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Jethro Lokosu, and I will be reading your corporate scripture today. Our scripture is as uh, in Psalm 121, verse 1 to 8. I will lift up my eyes to the hill. From whence comes my help? My help, my help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Thank you, New Light. And have a blessed day. Oh, 
above my future, found in you only. God, I'm depending on you. Thank you, Sky. That was beautiful. That was pure praise. As we come before the Lord in our time of corporate prayer, I would encourage you to put your prayers in the chat. Um, those prayers, whether you know it or not, get disseminated out into our uh, prayer team led by Minister Deidre. So just know that there's a ripple effect to that. When you put your prayers in the chat, they will spread out and you will always have people that you may not even know praying for you. I'd also like to encourage those who maybe you don't even have the courage to raise your hand this morning and say you need prayer, but just know that God knows your needs. He knows what we need and what's on our hearts even before we come to him and, and, and speak it. So, so trust that God knows those needs too. Um, there's some specific issues and people we need to pray for this morning. We want to pray for uh, the relief aids in Ukraine and Russia and also Haiti and Afghanistan for all those who are suffering in the world. We want to continue to pray for the healing of our um, members, Deacon Patrick Cruz and Maya Robinson, and to pray for all those who are struggling with mental illness. You know, the statistic is Deacon Al mentioned uh, people who are experiencing homelessness. The statistic is that the people that are experiencing homelessness, 25% of those people are dealing with a serious mental illness. So we lift them up to you and we need to continue to pray for proper diagnosis and treatment of those mental illnesses. We want to lift up these individuals, Mother Anna Andino, Mother Marilyn Clark, Roy DaCosta, Michelle Dade, Beverly Days, Christopher Gonzalez, Dietrich Hayes, Gina Hayes, 
Andrea Hernandez, my brother Ishmael, Carol Jackson, Roy Lucas, Elder Wes and Ariane Marcelin, Michael Marriott, Raquel Santiago, Mother Georgiana Spann, Claude Talley, Fred Talley, Mother Ella Talley, Jeff Talley, our Mother Mary Williams, and all our marriages. And I, I have three of my own I would like to add to that list. Um, I was talking to somebody who served a lot of time in the military, and they say, you know, the reason military does things in threes is because that's about all that anybody can remember. So I would like to also add to that prayer list all our teachers, some of whom are going back this week for orientation. Some of these teachers have jumped in to teach summer school, and they haven't had much of a break um, before the fall semester. So I pray for renewal and refreshment for all our teachers in this really, really important ministry that they have of, of teaching and, and instructing our kids. I pray for all those who work for affordable housing. Tomorrow is the day that we pay our rent for those renters, and rent in New York is an all-time high. So continue to pray for those who work for an advocate for affordable housing. And lastly, I pray for our Congress, and especially those who always say no because that's the way that they hold on to their influence. And I was thinking about this morning, if they say yes, they might actually have to do something. So I pray for a new spirit of cooperation and collaboration to take over in Washington, D.C., because there's so much talent in Washington. If we all got together, we could do anything. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God that hears and answers prayers we lift up to you all our prayer concerns, both the ones that we say out loud and the ones that are hidden in our hearts. Mostly we pray for peace, peace in our world, peace of mind, peace on these streets of Harlem and in Ethiopia, in Haiti, in Yemen, and all the other troubled parts of the world. Today is the day you have commanded us to rest. Lead us into that green pasture, Lord. Push us down in the grass if necessary and grant us rest so that in the week ahead, we can be the good news in a world that suffers from lack of encouragement. Boldly, we come before you because you've not given us a spirit of timidness, but of power and love and self-control. Bless Pastor Charmaine as she brings the word this morning and give her rest all these things we pray in the name of the one who can do exponentially more than we could ever dream or imagine. All these things we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.
when the day of evil comes, we have got to stand. Thank you so much, Zaire and the Bobby Lewis Ensemble. It is a wonderful day today. It's a beautiful, the sun is shining, and I am so happy that we are, even in our living rooms, praising the Lord. Uh, so today, the sermon comes from a passage in Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 18. And Jeremiah in this pas passage talks about a uh, um, a fire shut up in his bones. And I'm going to read the passage before we go into prayer and into the sermon. And it says, Oh Lord, you have deceived me and I was deceived. You are stronger than I and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a fire shut up in my bones and I'm weary with holding it in. And I cannot, for I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him, say all my close friends watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived, then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior, therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed for they, are, they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten, O Lord of hosts who tests the righteous, who sees the heart of, and the mind. Let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hands of evildoers. Cursed be the day on which I was born, the day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let the man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without, without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon because he did not kill me in the womb. Say my, so my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out from the womb to see toil and sorrow? and spend my days in shame? What a question. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your word, which never comes back to your void. Thank you so much, Lord God, for your people. And thank you for the word that you have put on my heart today for your people. I pray even now, Father God, in spite of preparation, that you would let yourself be heard that you would let yourself be seen, Lord God, and that you be honored and glorified in this message. I love you and I praise you and give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Wow, um, this text is a lot. And Jeremiah speaks about a fire shut up in his bones, but the title of today's sermon is A Praise That Shut Up In My Bones. My charge as I see it is to use this passage which does not seem to do very much praising at all, and to draw a parallel to praising God. Now, I don't want to talk for 30 or so minutes and not make a point or two. So I want to start by naming those right off the bat. The first is that God created us with purpose, right? So if God created us with purpose, what is it? And point number two is, he will use whomever he chooses, however he chooses to fill, fulfill his purpose. Point three, three, is that we need to start strong in the Lord and to finish strong. So I am a fan of using God's word to explain God's word. And yes, it is really great to draw parallels in our life, but sometimes it is just good to go straight to scripture. So I'm going to start with scripture. And my first is Isaiah 43, 
20 to 21, which says, the wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, that they might declare my praise. Now, wild beasts praise and honor God because of the benefit they reap from God's gift to the people that he chooses, but his people don't praise him. <laughs> Second scripture, John chapter 4, 23 says, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Are you getting kind of a sense of what I'm saying here? The purpose of our lives is praise. In all our circumstances, our purpose is to praise God. Psalm 150, one through six reads, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipe, praise him with sounding cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Psalm 100, one through five, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth, serve the Lord with gladness, come into his presence with singing, know that the Lord, he is God, it is he who made us and we are his, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So we're created with one overarching purpose, to praise the Lord. That praise might take many and varied forms, but the core of the message is that we have got to give praise. Praise with the work of our hands, with the sound of our voice, with the love for each other, with the patience we display when we really don't want to. Praise with our acts of kindness, praise with compassion, praise with our obedience to God, praise with our love. Demonstrate that God um, loves us because these reveal his character and we are made in the image of God. I mean, to me, I mean, praise just is that thing that we do in all of the things that, um, that we do in our lives. So the second point is that God chooses whom he wishes to, to praise him, and he chooses how that person does it. So I know we like to basically have a measure of control over our lives, and we like things to go the way we want them to go. I mean, at the end of the day, we think that we are the masters of our own destiny. I'm sorry, we're not you know, we just need to come to that understanding and accept that. Now, this passage for today is taken from the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, um, like all of us, was cre created to praise God. We are in a constant state of praise, whether we know it or not. The challenge is that we are, or the truth of the matter, is that we are hardly ever praising God when we're praising. If we're honest, 
if we're honest, if we're truly honest with ourselves, with others, and with God, we know that oftentimes we're praising people, we're praising places, we're praising our possessions, and then sometimes we're praising God. Now to frame our passage today, today we wanna bring um, Jeremiah into focus. Jeremiah was a preacher's kid. He was the son of a priest called Hilkiah, and the Lord called him to be a prophet when he was still very young. Now, some people are called, some people are devoted, like Samuel, for instance, was devoted and dedicated to the Lord by his mother as, as her sacrifice for having been given a gift that she prayed for. Jeremiah, on the other hand, was called by God and set apart for his service. Jeremiah preached be, um, during the reign of three different kings in Judah. Since the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, through the reign of Jehoiakim, and 11 years into the reign of Zedekiah, until Jerusalem was taken into captivity. Now, that's a lot of time, folks. That's a lot of time. And we are going to spend some time talking about this call of Jeremiah's. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8, it says, Now the Lord came to me saying, this is Jeremiah, this is his first call. And the Lord says to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, oh Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak for I am only a youth. And today's Youth Sunday, so I particularly want you, the youth, to pay attention to this because God is always speaking to us and we don't know, you know, oftentimes when he is giving us like really important messages that should sustain us for the rest of our lives. So we have to really pay attention. We have to fast and pray. We have to dedicate time to the Lord. We have to read his word. So he says, Lord, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But here's what the Lord says to Jeremiah. He says, do not say I'm only a youth. For to all whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. So here it is that God has already taken the idea of Jeremiah's control out of his hands, out of his mind, out of his heart. Listen, you are mine. I am sending you. And you don't worry about what you're going to say because I am going to tell you what to say. Don't worry about who you're going to speak to because I am going to show you the people that you need to speak to. Don't try to do it your way. I am the boss of you. Now, he didn't say it quite like that, but you know, you understand what I'm saying. And to top it off, the Lord ends it by saying this. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. I'm going to repeat that because in my mind that bears repeating. It says, do not be afraid of them, for I am. I'm with you to deliver you. So A, the Lord is acknowledging that Jeremiah is going to be afraid. Yes, because he's a youth, but because his message is not going to be easy to hear. It is not going to be a message easily accepted. It is not going to be palatable to the masses. It is not going to please anyone. He is going to make a lot of people very angry. And he is going to be afraid to give that message. Have you ever been in that position where you know you have to say something to someone? You know they're not going to like it, but you know you're going to have to say it anyway. How many times do you ham and haw? How many times do you try to avoid that thing that you have to say that you know has to be said? 
Here the Lord is already preparing Jeremiah, Jeremiah and he's saying, listen, Jeremiah, I know it's going to be tough. But relax, be cool because I'm here. I am going to sustain you. I'm going to deliver you. He knows he's going to be, need to deliver, to be delivered from these situations. And so not only does God tell him that, yes, I am calling you, but he also says, I'm going to be with you because I care about you and I know you're going to need me. He's not setting him up to fail. How many times have you been given something to do by someone, be it a parent or be it a boss or be it a teacher at school, and they give you a task to do and they don't prepare you? They try to get you to figure it out. Listen, this is what I need you to do. Just figure it out. God isn't that kind of God because he is caring and loving and he knows that we need not just instruction, but he knows we need support and encouragement. And he is there in this verse, giving Jeremiah just that. This to me is awesome. I'm excited for Jeremiah. What? God is calling him? If he, and you know, whew, yes. And it's exciting to know that God is calling you until you realize that you're giving a hard, given a hard message. And the people of Judah, like the rest of Israel, I mean, they are not known for being kind or to suffer fools uh, easily because we know that they had already forsaken the Lord. They are po praising possessions, people, position, and power. Now, Jeremiah in cha um, chapter 2, verse 13, says this. See, the Lord already knows what's happening, which is why he calls Jeremiah. And he's telling Jeremiah that my people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn out for themselves cisterns that hold no water. I'm going to read that again because I want you to really think about the the um, the metaphors that God is using here. And he's saying, the people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. So they have forsaken God, who is the fountain of living water. And they have hewn out for themselves cisterns so they're replacing this fountain with a cistern that holds no water now a fountain is this thing that constantly flows it is a constantly feeding pool and it feels pools of streams and goes usually into larger bodies of water that become rivers that then lead into larger bodies of water on the other hand, a cistern is a place that collects. It does not flow. It simply collects. And it only collects that what others put into it. So if no one fills it, it stays empty. And any water that collects there unless that water is stirred with an external force becomes stagnant and eventually becomes putrid and is good for nothing. Now, rest with me in this for just a little bit. God is this fountain flowing with water, which means there is a source from which this water is coming, right? And it is flowing and it's constantly flowing and it's feeding and it's feeding not just this one particular thing, but it is able to feed great swaths of land and, and people and things. Whereas this dirty putrid thing called a cistern is a place that is good only for dumping. 
and after you dump, you can take and measure out. But it is not, it is not um, a constantly um, renewing source. Why is it that we as humans tend to want to give away this fountain that is ours for the taken and replace it with the cistern? Could it be that we can control what is in the cistern, but we have no control over the fountain? Could it be that we are more concerned with what we want than what God wants to give to us? In chapter three of Jeremiah it tells the people that they are polluted, mm, like the cistern that is not stirred, that the land is polluted and the Lord will withhold water you know, that flowing water. The spring rain will not come, but the people refuse to be ashamed. They carry on just the way they had been before, and especially in idolatry, the cistern, as opposed to the fountain, which is God. Then in chapter four, he begs the people to return to the Lord, to break up their fallow ground, and to circumcise their hearts, meaning to cut away those things that have made their hearts hard, hard. Their hearts hard, but the people aren't listening. Jeremiah continues in this way throughout the entire book. And what is his reward? The people definitely don't listen. They're greedy for unjust gain. They deal falsely and preach peace when there is no peace. Now, understand that already these people are God's chosen people. And this is the remnant of the vast body that God had called, the body that was called Israel. And now they're just down to Judah. And even Judah, the last, they are still just going ahead and doing their own thing. Do we see that in the church today? That even those of us who are calling ourselves the church, the true worshipers, worshipers of God, how many of us are still falling at the, the, the temple of money? How many of us are still uh, falling at the feet of Madison Avenue and all uh, and the desire for power and politicking our way through and, and trying to make our lives have meaning through the things of the world rather than through the praise and honor and worship and glory of God. How many of us are actually listening to the preacher on a Sunday morning and turning up our noses because the preacher is saying something that we don't actually want to ha have to live by? Not because the preacher said it, but because God said it. But here's the thing about God. See, the idea that he is God means that he can make the rules he wants. The idea that he is God means that he is in control. The idea that he is God means he gets to tell us what to do and we get to listen or not because he also gave us choice. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Pastor Bobby likes to say, I wish he would just knock me over the head and make me, uh, me obey, but no. Because God is saying, you need to want me because you want me, not just because I want you to want me. Many of us um, are always saying this to other people. In relationships, um, you know, there's division of labor and in a household, there are things that sometimes need to be done and typically certain things go to the role of the woman. And a lot of that sometimes is the cooking and cleaning. But the woman is also out working just like the man, right? But she comes home and she cooks and she cleans. And now sometimes the man does this. So um, let's just say whomever does the typical household 
chores, this person sometimes wants a break. And they ask this, the, their other partner or they may ask their kids to do, you know, the thing that they need help with. And they say they're going to do it, but then what do they do? They do it in their time. They do it when they feel like doing it, how they feel like doing it. But here's the thing. When a person asks you to do something, children pay close attention. When a person asks you to do something, they are not interested in you doing it the way you want to do it. They actually want you to do it the way they would have done it themselves had they the time to do it. So the only way to honor them is to actually do the thing, A, in the timeliness that they ask you to do it. Like, so if they say, hey, listen, I can't do so-and-so, could you do it for me? It means they actually want it done then. Because the fact is that they're doing something else in that moment. And in that moment is when they want it done. Unless, of course, they say, hey, if you get a chance, could you do thus and so for me? Then you have some wriggle room. But if they don't say that, I guarantee you that they want you to do it when they ask. That's the first thing. And assume that what I'm saying here is when God says do something, he actually wants you to do it when he says, not when you feel like it. Okay. The other part of that is when they ask you to do the thing, like do the dishes, don't just do the dishes the way you think they should be done and say that it's good enough. Do it the way you know that they would have you do it. Unless they say, listen, I'm really not very good at this and you are much better at this than I am. So would you please do this? Then please don't do it the way they would have done it because we know that they're asking you because you're the expert. Case in point, I like things done well, but I don't often know how to do the thing well that I want to have done. Like a organization, not very good at that. I like things organized, but I'm not good in organizing. So if I need something organized and I ask an organized person to do it for me, it's because I need it done in that manner, organized. Now, if they did it the way I would have done it, I may as well have done it myself. Okay, what's the point here? God is everything. He is organized. He is smart. He is, name it, he is that. If he tells you to do it, do it the way he would have you do it. So he says, as unto the Lord. That actually means when I want you to do something, I really, really want you to know that um, I am asking you to do it this way because I am God, all right? I think I've belabored that point. Um, so the people are greedy for unjust gain, as we said before, and they deal falsely with each other. And they are actually saying that there is peace when the Lord clearly said that if you do not follow my leading, if you do not follow me, if you constantly continue to go after other gods, there will be no peace. And in fact, you will be destroyed, but they don't listen. But through it all, Jeremiah keeps preaching. Now, I want you to think here about Jeremiah because Jeremiah is preaching a hard thing. But because Jeremiah is doing it the way God tells him in the instance he tells him, this is actually Jeremiah's act of praise. He keeps on saying, what does say the Lord? So we get to the text and he's complaining to God. But even in his complaining, Jeremiah is obedient to God. His Obedience is his act of love and devotion and yes, praise. He confesses that he really doesn't feel like he gets a fair shake and he doesn't. He feels tricked into this by God. He says so. <laughs> uh, God did say, I will be with you to deliver you though, right? In chapter one, verse eight. 
But I think that right now, Jeremiah doesn't know what to do. So he does the only thing he knows, and which is he calls on God, the God who called him in his youth. And you've got to see that even in the complaining, Jeremiah is not swerving from the call. He is still faithful to the call. It's hard, but he's pressing on. He's leaning in. I love to say that, lean in. You know, when um, when you're, you're, you're listening to someone and you're leaning in, it really shows that you're into what they're saying, right? You are you're trying to focus really hard to grasp what they're saying. So this leaning in is just this, this taking your whole self, your whole heart, your whole mind, your whole body into this thing that God, God is calling to. And this thing is his, he's leaning into praising in spite of difficulty. And he remembers, but the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. This is, um, back to our uh, our foundational scripture for today in verse 11. It says, but the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O oh, Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. I'm asking you today, what difficult thing has God asked you to do? You know, God... It calls many a person. <laughs> and God calls people who do not follow him. And over and over, we know that God has called people who um, don't even want to know him. They are worshiping other things. I mean, the father of the faith, Abraham, was one of those people. But today I want to just draw your attention to Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel chapter 4, 28 to 37, um, we talk about the result of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's uh, power and his foolishness because of his power. Because Nebuchadnezzar thinks that he is powerful because he is powerful, not because God allowed him to be thus. So the scripture says, at the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace in Babylon. And the king answered and said, is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? Well, the words, <laughs> while the words were still on the king's uh, in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Hmm. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. Now, I want us to say, don't take God's words lightly because God will, he will fulfill his word by whatever means necessary. Now, of course, after a time, Nebuchadnezzar is restored. And in chapter 34, it says, at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven 
and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabit inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me and I was established in my kingdom and still more greatness was added to me and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol the, and honor the king of heaven for all his works are right and his ways are just and those who walk in, pr in pride, he is able to humble. Hmm. So if we're following the story, in the beginning, God uses Nebuchadnezzar to take Judah captive. This, by the way, is the thing that Jeremiah had been prophesying. So Nebuchadnezzar takes Judah captive and he subdues them. And God uses Nebuchadnezzar to exact punishment on Judah for their disobedience and idolatry. But we need to be careful about how we take credit for God's work because Nebuchadnezzar gave himself credit for having conquered Judah. We give ourselves credit for the things that God allows us, like success. We tend to forget that any success that we gain is uh, allowed by God. So God humbles Nebuchadnezzar. He will humble us. And only then... Does Nebuchadnezzar praise God? Do you have to wait for God to humble you before you praise him? Can we praise God in the good times? Can we look at our accolades and our good things, not just at the moment of having had them, but even when we are living in the lap of luxury and we feel like there is no real need to get down on our knees and be worshipful and to praise God, not because we have, but because he is. Then and only then are we actually praising God the way that he wants to be praised. Now, I pray that we who call ourselves Christ followers, we who call ourselves God's people, can end our walk, we can go to our final destination the way we started. Because many of us start with zeal for the Lord. But as the hardships of life come our way, as we get battered and tossed and turned by the waves of misfortune and misadventure and sickness and just the vagaries of life, we tend to wilt. Like God did say, I will be with you. He did say, I will rescue you. And maybe we need to look at the misfortunes as that thing that is making us better. You know, I, I was listening to, um, uh, was it yesterday? Yes, it was yesterday. I was listening to a devotion and the woman was saying that, you know, her son plays baseball. I know from nothing about baseball. And she's saying that, you know, he's a catcher or whatever. And when he gets this glove, it's new and it's pristine and it's beautiful. But as he uses it, as he catches ball after ball, as he dives to the ground and the dirt cuffs it, the, the glove becomes soft and pliable. And it doesn't become good to look at, but becomes good for use. It becomes this beautiful thing that is now malleable and is great for the actual thing that it was designed for to be used for. I submit that the challenges that life presents and will present make us better to, for service in the kingdom of God. Make us um, 
have a need to call out to God because oftentimes we won't call him unless we feel the need for his presence. Don't become so disillusioned and discouraged with life that we become bitter and hard of heart. Don't pay back slights and wrongs tit for tat. That is not a way to praise God. It's a sure road to legalism. You know, there are those people who love to use the word of God as weapons. Not good weapons, but weapons that, that prove to others how much better we are than they. That's not what God intended. Isaiah 46, 9 to 11 says, Remember the former things of old. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done. Saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God's purpose is his praise. So let's just get that out there. Calling a bird of prey from the east a man of his purpose from the far country. Truly, I have spoken. Truly, I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely, I will do it. Huh. The book of Jeremiah starts with the call of Jeremiah. And throughout his ministry, he prophesies an unpopular message for which he was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was reviled. For years... Decades, really, he pre preaches a message of destruction from for Judah, and it finally comes to pass. And Jeremiah lived his purpose fully. He fully praised God in the discomfort of it all. Can we say that we will be there, that we will be praising God in spite of the discomforts, in spite of the vagaries, in spite of the hard thing that God calls us to. Listen, God knows you. And can I just tell you one thing? If God calls you to something difficult, he has prepared you for it. Even if you think that he hasn't, he has. He is not an unfair God. He has given you his word. He has given you time. He's given you revelation. He's given you opportunity to sit with him. He's given you wise counsel. He has given you places to be. He's given you everything that you need. Take advantage. <clears throat> I want to be able to say, like David said in Psalm 34, 1 to 4, that I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes us boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Listen, the Lord says that he will be with us. He says to Jeremiah that I will be with you. He'll be with you guys. He says to um, Isaac, uh, Joshua, have I not commanded you? Do not be dismayed. Do not be afraid. For I am the Lord and I will be with you. Like I was with Moses, I will be with you. Do not be, be afraid. Do not be dismayed. He's saying the same thing to you. If you're listening and you're, you're a youth, you've been called, my friend. If you're listening and you're a senior, you have been called. If you're listening and you're a young adult, you have been called. If you're close to the grave, you have been called. If you're a babe in arms and you're listening and you can understand this, you have been called. Don't be fooled. Each and every one of us has been called, but we each have a specific call. You may have been called to the ministry of the theater. You may have been called to the ministry of street sweeper. You may have been called to the ministry of the pulpit. 
You may have been called to the ministry of domesticity, but you have been called. And in everything that we do, in everything that we do, be it secular or sacred, we have been called and in it, we praise the Lord. Don't be fooled. For a Christian, there is no such thing as the purely secular because everything is teaching something, someone something about the Lord. Do not misuse the gifts and the freedoms that we have been given in the Lord. We are his. We're not our own. We are his. Remember that. Take that. Cherish that. We are his. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I love you. I praise God for you. I hope that today this message has touched you and has given you fodder for your life. And I pray that the Lord be with you today. Let us pray. Thank you, dear God, for your loving mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you that um, you are not a God who prevaricates. You are not a God who uh, is false. You are not a God who sets us up for failure. You are a God who loves us. You are a God who is our refuge and our strength and our guide. You are a God who calls us for your good purpose, for your praise. And I love you, Father, and I praise it today and pray that your people have been edified. I ask that you would just go with us as we go into the world to make disciples in every instance, in every place where we are called. In the matchless name of Jesus, I pray all these things. And the Lord's people said, amen. I love you. Go with God. We hope this service has touched your life in a special way. Please subscribe to our page so you can keep in touch with us. May God bless you, and we hope to see you again.